Introduction to Probability, Finite Math, Chapter 8, Section 3. Okay, we're going to start with a few uh, terms that you need to get down, that you need to understand. First of all, we have a random experiment. Uh, it could also be called ram a random phenomenon. This is an experiment or an event where the outcomes cannot be predicted but have a regular distribution in a large number of repetitions. Now, when we say cannot be predicted, what we mean is that we can't predict the outcome of a specific uh, run through the event. For example, flipping a coin. We know that it's either going to be heads or tails. So in that sense, we know what the outcome will be in a general sense, but we don't know the outcome ahead of time for an individual flip of the coin. A trial is a repetition of a random event or random experiment. So for example, again, flipping the coin, every time you flip a coin, that would be a trial. The outcome is the possible result of each trial. So flipping a coin will be heads or tails. And the sample space is the set of all possible outcomes for a trial. So again, for a coin, that would be heads and tails. And here it is spelled out for you. Flipping a coin would be a random experiment. Each flip is a trial. The outcome is the result of the flip and the sample space is heads, tails. Notice how we write the sample space. We write it as a set using the braces, putting a comma in between each item. So for example, we're gonna give the sample space for each of these random experiments. Uh, as we go through them, why don't you pause the recording and see if you can do it and then resume the recording to check your answer. First of all, spinning the spinner. Okay, pause and see if you can come up with the sample space for this. You should have gotten the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. By the way, just got a comment. I love the name on it. It is the spinner thingy. Good brand name there. Okay, on to part B. For the purposes of a public opinion poll, respondents are classified as young, middle-aged, or senior, and as male or female. Now, keep in mind here, you're going to have two words or two classifications, um, age and gender, for each outcome. Pause the recording, see if you can come up with this sample space, and then resume the recording to check your answer. Okay, we have young male, young female, middle-aged male, middle-aged female, senior male, and senior female. So you should have had all of those. Uh, the sets of parentheses will represent one outcome because we have two results for one outcome. Now we've got an experiment consisting of studying the numbers of boys and girls in family with exactly three children. Let B represent boy and G represent girl. See if you can come up with the sample space of possibilities for the numbers of boys and girls in a family with three children. Pause the recording and then resume to see how you did. Okay, one way to do this is to use a tree again to organize our way of thinking. Um, each time a child is born, it can be either a boy or a girl. So what you do is you start with two branches for the first child, the boy and the girl. For the second child, you consider the possibility that the first was a boy and the second could be a boy or girl. And so you have the branches off of that. You also consider that the first could have been a girl and then you've got two possibilities, boy and girl, and then so on. And then by the time you get to the third child, you've got a total of eight branches there at the end. So we have eight possibilities and you see those listed there. Uh, notice that we are taking the order into account. We're not just saying, you know, how many um, you know, we could have three boys, three girls, two boys, two girls. We're actually looking at the order that they're born also as a part of our sample space. Okay, an event is an outcome or a set of outcomes from a random experiment. It is a subset of the sample space. So for example, an ordinary die is a cube with six different faces that show the following number of dots. One, two, three, four, five, and six. You know what a die is, I'm sure. If the die is fair, that means it's not weighted, then any one of the faces is equally likely to come up when the die is rolled. 
So the sample space for uh, the rolling of a single fair die is S equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So some possible events could be that the die shows an even number, and that would consist of 2, 4, or 6, or that the die shows a 1, and then you only have one possible uh, outcome for that event. The next one is that the die shows a number that's less than 5, so that gives us uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4 as the um, possible outcomes for that particular event. And then the die shows a multiple of 3, which would give us only 3 and 6. Okay, for this example, we're going to look back at the sample space we developed in example 1c, where you had the family with three children. You had the different possibilities for how those children uh, could be born as far as their gender goes. And we're going to write the given events in set notation. Pause the recording between each of these and see if you can come up with it, and then resume the recording to see how you did. So first of all, event H is when the family has exactly two girls. Okay, there's three ways that can happen. The first child could be a boy and second and third girls. The first and third could be girls and the middle child a boy. Or you could have first and second girls and the third one a boy. Now try event K. The three children are the same gender. There's really only two ways this can happen. They're either all girls or all boys, so just two possibilities. And finally, event J, the family has three girls. Okay, only one way that this could happen, three girls. Now, if an event equals the sample space, then the event is a certain event. For example, if I said, um, my event is that I flip a coin and I get heads or tails. Well, that, that's the only two possibilities. In fact, that represents my entire sample space. So that is a certain event. Uh, if the event is the empty set, then the event is an impossible event. So here's an example. Suppose you roll a fair die. The sample space is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. We're going to find the event that the die shows a 4. Pause the recording, see if you can figure this out, and resume to check your answer. Okay, there's only one way that could happen, and that's if you get a 4. So, very simple answer. Now see if you can find the event where the number showing is less than 10. Well, the event would be the entire sample space because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are all less than 10. So this is a certain event. The number showing has to be less than 10 if it's a normal six-sided die. Finally, show the event the die shows a 7. Okay, this is going to be the empty set. The normal die that we've described does not have a 7 on it. It is an impossible event. Okay, here's a summary of the set operations for events. It says let E and F be events for sample space S. Then E intersecting F occurs when both E and F occur. E union with F occurs when E or F or both occur. And then E prime, which is the complement of E, occurs when E does not occur. Uh, same thing that we've been talking about, nothing really new here. I would just caution you again, remember what we talked about, I talked about this on a previous recording, and I mentioned it in class. When we're doing probability in sets and things like that, the words and and or kind of take on a little different um, flavor to them than they do when we use them normally in the English language. When I tell my children they can have an ice cream and a cookie, um, that means they get to have both of them. Intersection means it has to occur in both of them at the same time. It's only the parts where they both occur. Normally when I tell my children you can have a cookie or an ice cream, it means they can have one or the other, but not both. But in sets and probability, the word or indicates one, the other, or both. Um, so and is very restrictive. It has to happen in both at the same time. And 
the or is very open. It happens in both of them together. It's everything in one and the everything in the other combined. So here's another example. A study of college students grouped the students into various categories that can be interpreted as events when a student is selected at random. Consider these events. Okay, E is going to represent that the student is under 20. F will indicate that the student is male and G that the student is a business major. Describe these events in words. And as we go through these, pause the recording and see if you can do them and then resume to check your answer. The first event is E prime or the complement of E. Well, E is that the student is under 20, so the opposite of that, the complement of that, would be that the student is 20 or older. Now try the complement of F intersecting with G. The complement of F would be students that are not male, in other words, female, and G would be business majors. So we're talking about a student that is not male and is also a business major, or in other words, a female business major. And then finally, see if you can find the complement of E or G in union with G. Okay, this would refer to the event that the student is 20 years or older, or a business major, or both. So it's going to be all the students that are 20 years of age or older combined with the business majors. Okay, disjoint events are two events that cannot occur at the same time. For example, you cannot flip a coin one time and get both a head and a tail on that one toss of that one single coin. Disjoint events could also be called mutually exclusive events. Uh, once you've gotten one result, no other result can happen. They cannot happen together at the same time. And here's a little rule for them. Disjoint events. Uh, two events are disjoint if their intersection is the empty set. For example, okay, let S be 1 through 6, which is the sample space for tossing a die. As we go through probability, you're going to notice we use um, dice a lot and we use playing cards a lot. They're great examples uh, coins also. Great examples, great ways to talk about probability. E is going to be 4, 5, and 6, and G is going to be 1 and 2. Are they disjoint? Okay, pause the recording and think about this for a minute and resume the recording to check your answer. Yeah, these are indeed disjoint. Disjoint events have nothing in common. They have no intersection. 4, 5, and 6, 1, and 2, there is no intersection between them. And you can see with the Venn diagram there that they're completely separate. So these two events are disjoint. For sample spaces with equally likely outcomes, the probability of an event is defined as follows. This is our basic probability principle. It says let S be a sample space of equally likely outcomes and let event E be a subset of S. The probability that E occurs is, okay, the probability of E is the number of elements in E over the number of elements in S. By definition, the probability of an event is a number that indicates the relative likelihood of the event. The probability tells you how likely something is to occur. Now, really super important to notice that this principle applies to sample spaces of equally likely outcomes. Uh, the examples we've talked about before, uh, dice, the numbers one through six, if you roll a fair die, have equally likely outcomes. The heads or tails on a fair coin, equally likely outcomes. So uh, they would, we would be able to use this principle with them. So suppose a single fair die is rolled, have our sample space there, give the probability of each event. All right, as we go through these, pause the recording and give each a try and then resume the recording to check your answer. What's the probability the die shows an even number? Well, 
Even numbers would be 2, 4, and 6, which is, there's three possibilities. The sample space has six elements, so 3 over 6, or 1 half. Now try F. The die shows a number less than 10. Well, F is a certain event. All of the numbers in the sample space are less than 10. The probability of F is 6, because there's six members of that event over six, six in the sample space, which is one. So a certain event has a probability of one. And finally, find the probability that the die shows an eight. Kiji is an impossible event. It contains zero elements. None of the members of the sample space are eight. So it's zero out of six, which is zero. Another thing we're going to talk about um, as we go through probability is going to be the layout. Is going to be a deck of cards. So it's really important to be familiar with that layout. Now, if you already are familiar, this is going to be a little redundant for you, and you can kind of skip this part. But if you're not really familiar with the layout of a deck of cards, you need to listen up. Now, the they actually do have that layout on the formula sheet for this course. So um, if you are doing a problem and you get a little confused, you will have that there for you. So a deck of cards is a useful tool for discussing probability. Standard deck has 52 cards, four suits, hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades, and each suit has 13 cards. Hearts and diamonds are red, spades and clubs are black. Each suit has an ace, a king, a queen, and a jack, and then cards numbered from two to 10. The jack, king, and queen are called face cards, and they can be thought of having the values of 11, 12, and 13. The jack will be 11, the queen 12 and the king 13. The ace can be considered either the low card and have a value of one or the high card and have a value of 14. A little diagram kind of laying out the deck of cards for you. I think this is similar to what you have on the formula sheet. So when a single card is drawn at random from a standard well shuffled 52 card deck, we're going to find the probability of each of the given events. We're going to find the probability first of drawing an ace. Now as we go through these, pause the recording and give it a try and resume the recording to see how you did. All right, we have four aces in a deck out of 52 cards, which gives us a probability of one out of 13, one over 13. Now try finding the probability of drawing a face card. There are three face cards per suit, and there are four suits, so we have 12 face cards in a deck. So 12 over 52, that gives us 3 out of 13. Now find the probability of drawing a spade. There are 13 spades in a deck. 13 out of 52 is 1 fourth. Now find the probability of drawing a spade or a heart. The probability of a spade or a heart is 26 out of 52. There's 13 spades, 13 hearts, which gives us a total of 26 cards, and that's a probability of one half. Notice that in that example, the probability of each event was a number between 0 and 1, and this is going to be true in general. Any event E is a subset of the sample space. So the least number of outcomes you can have is 0, it's the empty set, and the most number would be the same as the number of elements in the sample space. And because we express the probability as a fraction of the number of desired outcomes in the event over the number of elements in the sample space, you're always going to get a, res uh, a result between 0 and 1. So your probabilities must always be between 0 and 1. If the probability is 0, then it's an impossible event, and if it's 1, it's a certain event. Now, many real-life problems, the events in the sample space are not all le equally likely. So in this case, what we do is we estimate the probabilities by determining the long-run proportion that a specific outcome will occur 
after many repetitions under identical and independent circumstances. Um, let me give you an example of that. If you think about a basketball player, um, a lot of times we get statistics on, on um, famous sports figures like you know, their chances of hitting a free throw if they're a basketball player. The chances of a professional basketball player hitting a three free throw are not one half. You, know, you might think, well, either he makes it or he doesn't, so it's one half. Well, actually, because of his experience and his practice, he has a much greater chance of hitting that free throw. And how they determine the probability that he will make a free throw is by observing his um, free throws over time by collecting data and watching and observing, and then you can get an idea of the probability that that player will hit a, three, a free throw. Okay, so when we do this, this long run proportion is called the relative frequency probability. And estimates based on this are called empirical probabilities. Empirical meaning we get these probabilities from what we observe. Independence, okay, it said that this would be from independent circumstances. Independence refers to the idea that what occurs in one trial or in one run has no effect on the outcome of another run. So, let's say that we want to determine the probability that a newly manufactured sink contains a defect. So, we examine the first sink off the assembly line, and it's fine. So, we estimate that the probability of defects is zero, because the first one was fine. But let's say that the second one has a defect. Well, now, we have a probability of 1 over 2, or 0.5. And if we keep doing this, well, here's 10 samples of the sink and some of them have defects, some of them don't. Notice the relative frequency at the bottom. It, it's kind of up and down at 0 to 0 0.5. The third one was fine, so now our probability is 1 third. And then it went to 1 fourth, and then 0.2, and kind of back and forth. So the, these relative frequencies fluctuate a lot, um, especially early on. So to get a better, more accurate estimate, we need to examine these things over the long run. We need to not just do uh, 2 or 3 or 5 or 10 or even 20. We need to take a lot of samples and see what's going on, and that will give us a much better and much more accurate estimate. When the conditions are repeated a large number of times, the relative frequencies will stop fluctuating so much and will stabilize into what's called the long run frequency. The tables on the next page are going to show the frequencies of defects after 50 trials and then 1,000. And you should notice that over time, you don't see that line going up and down as much, and it flattens out at a certain number. In fact, it stabilizes at about 0.25. Okay, here are the two charts. And as you can see, if you look at the chart on the left, which uh, is 50 trials, you can see how at first the uh, occurrences or the frequency fluctuates kind of wildly, but then over time they start to kind of settle down and eventually start to level out. And then with a thousand, you can see how we get kind of a leveling off right at 0.25. Okay, so for example, the General Social Survey picks U.S. residents at random and ask them many questions. One of the questions they asked in 2012 was, do you feel that your standard of living is much better, somewhat better, about the same, somewhat worse, or much worse than your parents? And we have a table that categorizes the responses. So for part A, you're gonna estimate the probability that a U.S. resident feels his or her standard of living is much better than that of his or her parents. Pause the recording to try this. I'll give you a little hint. You need to figure out how many people were surveyed total in order to get this. Pause the recording, give it a try, and resume the recording to check your answer. So set A is going to be the event that a resident feels that his or her standard of living is much better. What we need to do first, like I said, is find the total number of respondents. So you add everything together and you get 1,308. 
So we divide the frequency in the much better category, which is 413, by 1,308, and we get 0.3157. So we can use this relative frequency as our estimate of the long-run frequency and say the estimated probability that a U.S. resident feels his or her standard of living is much better is approximately 0.3157. Now for B, estimate the probability of the event B, that a U.S. resident feels that his or her standard of living is somewhat worse or worse. Again, pause the recording, give this a try, resume the recording to check your answer. Okay, we already know the total number of respondents, so that's taken care of. So what we're going to do is add the number of respondents in the two categories of somewhat worse and worse which is 162 plus 69, and that gives us 231. And when we divide, we get 0.1766. Now, because the respondents in the survey were chosen at random, independence is assumed. Remember we said that we do need to have independence. In other words, one trial or one run uh, can't affect the outcome of another. And one way we do that with surveys is by choosing people at random. Um, if you choose people that are, say, all in the same neighborhood, then there's probably not going to be independence. They're probably going to have similar circumstances and, to some degree, um, similar feelings about some things. So by, by selecting people randomly, you have a better chance of getting a broader uh, range of experience and a less of a chance that one person's response is going to have an effect on another person's response or a relationship to it. Now the table in the last example sets up what's called a probability distribution. It gives each possible outcome of the experiment, uh, gives it a number, and that number can be done in any reasonable way, but there are a couple things that have to be true when you're talking about probability distributions, and these are some of them. It says, let S be a sample space consisting of indistinct outcomes. In other words, you've got a sample space, you have a designated number of members of that sample space. An acceptable probability assignment consists of assigning to each outcome a number according to these following rules. So the first rule says that the probability of each outcome must be a number between 0 and 1. So every probability assigned or every number assigned has to be between, um, or excuse me, every probability assigned has to be between 0 and 1. So with that table, when we figure out the probabilities for each of those categories, the probability for each category has to be between 0 and 1. And number 2, the sum of all the probabilities has to equal 1. So when you figure out the probabilities for each of those categories and you add them all together, you should get one because the probability that one of those things will indeed happen is one. Here's a little extra practice. Uh, why don't you give this a try? Pause the recording as you go through it. Resume the recording to check your answers and continue this way through the rest of the recording.